all propulsion is the same. Hello everybody, I am Nick the Naval Architect. You know, readers frequently ask me to compare different methods of ship propulsion, to explain how a pump jet is different from a water jet. Now these are excellent questions, but they miss the larger insight. All propulsion is the same. The world of physics does not change from one type of propulsion to the next. All ship propulsion follows the same basic physics. And the different methods of propulsion, the different devices, these just emphasize one sector of physics over another. Insight into this continuum is going to be a major advantage. It allows us to better classify marine propulsion and to dissect past successes so we can search for new combinations. Let's look at this. Every marine propulsion device out there works by achieving two things. First, it creates a pressure difference, and then it applies that pressure to a surface to create forward thrust. Now, optionally, we might also add in a thrust augmentation device that helps generate that pressure difference, but that's all there is to everything in the world of propulsion. Create a pressure difference, use that pressure difference to generate forward thrust. That's all you need, and all the devices out there just have different ways of doing these two tasks. Now the reason it's hard to separate this out is because frequently the same device is going to achieve both tasks. But by separating the propulsion into these two different items, we can identify the different methods behind each task, and more importantly, we can start to see how all of the solutions out there are actually employing different combinations of these two concepts. So let's take a look at some examples. The following table shows some common propulsion devices and demonstrates how they achieve these two tasks. So if you were, say, to compare a conventional propeller to a pump jet, well, propeller, it's achieving that pressure difference using foil sections on the propeller blade. Now, where does it get its pressure surface from? Oh, that's the large propeller blade itself. So that's the case where we see the same device doing two tasks at once. But now compare that to a pump jet. People all the time ask me, how are they different? Do they operate on a totally different set of physics? No, no they don't. A pump jet is basically just a propeller with some additional thrust augmentation around it. And so now you're starting to see how the pump jet and the propeller are not that dissimilar. It's just taking an old idea and throwing a new twist onto it. Same thing, say, between a water jet and a ducted propeller. Somebody started with the idea of a ducted propeller, which has a thrust augmentation device of a duct, and they start to ask, well, what happens if I make that duct even longer, and if I put in some stators and maybe a nozzle on the end? Oh, now I have a water jet. And so when you start looking at these devices in this continuum, it's very instructive, because now you're starting to ask, what justified the change? What was there about the water jet that justified all of this extra equipment and extra thrust augmentation? Well, in the case of the water jet, it's because they were moving at much higher speeds. And so the insight from this table is being able to trace things back to their roots and understand the priorities behind them. So let's talk a little bit about how you generate a pressure difference. I'm not going to go into the detailed physics of it, but more just what are the options of how you can generate a pressure difference. It turns out there are really only two ways you can do this. The first method that I want to talk about is using foil sections. This is where we convert the power of a rotating shaft, like engine power, into some type of fluid power that generates thrust. Think of it like injecting energy into the flow stream of the water. The pressure difference normally comes from some type of rotating foil section. Basically the same idea as your airplane wing only spinning in a circle. Think of it like a helicopter blade. Now one side of that foil is going to generate a higher pressure and the other side generates a lower pressure. This is the fundamental physics behind your basic slow speed propeller. You've got a high side and a low side. Because they're not the same pressure, we get forward thrust. But now we start asking about what changes to warrant the other devices. You see, as the ship's velocity increases, 
we need to increase the propeller RPM to keep up. That higher RPM causes a problem. We now have the foils rotating faster and faster, and that's generating a centrifugal force that dominates the flow. That centrifugal force pushes the water radially out from the center of the propeller. Oh, that's a problem. Uh, that, that, that's not good. Propeller foils don't work when the water is running radially along the blade. The water throws out sideways and generates no pressure difference. Uh, that's a useless propeller. One solution would be to enclose the propeller inside a long tube. That's a water jet! We then call it an impeller because it's inside something. The walls of the tube trap the water flow, and now we can use that centrifugal force to our advantage. It becomes a secondary method of generating a pressure difference. But it still originates and starts with those foil sections. Now there is one other option for generating a pressure difference, and that's to change the density of the fluid, which is tending more towards thermodynamics than fluid dynamics. Combustion on rockets or jet engines? That's a great example of how we would change density. That heat creates this rapidly expanding gas. Rapid expansion is good. It generates massive pressure differences. Unfortunately, combustion doesn't really work well underwater. You ever managed to light a match underwater? It doesn't really work. Yet we don't really see this method in the marine world. And the reason is that it takes a lot of energy to convert water to steam to generate that pressure difference. Way more energy than when we're talking about combustion in air. So due to that, the efficiencies are low enough that it's not really worth doing in the maritime world. Although some experimental methods have tried to inject pressurized air for propulsion, those methods do work, but so far they are still less efficient than conventional foil sections. For marine propulsion, foil sections really are the best option to generate a pressure difference. So now, anytime you're looking at any type of propeller, that's what you're going to be looking for, is where's that foil section that's generating the dip pressure. Now, the shape of these foils does change. It depends on the ship's speed. At lower speeds, we're seeing straight section propellers. But at higher speeds, we go to the impeller, which is the best option, and it starts to get a lot fancier. But even in that case, the impeller largely depends on that foil section rather than just pure centrifugal force. All right, well, I promise you a continuum. And I just got done saying that as far as the pressure difference, there's really only one way to do it. The pressure surface, on the other hand, this is wide open to creative solutions. So to deal with this problem individually, let's imagine that we have a magic device that just generates this zone of high pressure in the middle of the water. Problem is, that water pressure, it pushes uniformly in all directions. If we were to contain that magic zone in a hollow sphere, it would push the same in every single direction. We get no thrust. The trick is to angle the surfaces and to leave one side exposed so that we're ending up with a net thrust in the forward direction doesn't matter how much energy we're putting in unless it gets converted to forward thrust. Pressure difference creates that energy for movement, but pressure surfaces are determine the efficiency of how we convert that energy into thrust. So what makes a good pressure surface? Well, the ideal surface would face mostly in the forward direction. It would have a huge surface area, and it would have very little resistance when traveling through the water. Hmm. Well, that's not physically possible. I mean, if we have this large pressure surface that's traveling through the water, it's going to create a huge amount of resistance. And that's why all practical pressure surfaces are a compromise. So let's take a look at some past compromises and the successes behind them. And here we come back to our good old friend, the propeller. The most common pressure surface is the foil of the propeller blades. This is one of the major reasons why propeller blades are so large, is we want a large surface area for pressure to push against. The other reason I wanted to show the propeller blades is because they employ another neat trick. The pressure surface could actually be multiple surfaces. The front face of that propeller blade gets pulled by a negative pressure, that's suction, but the back of the blade gets pushed by the higher pressure, 
Now, both of these combined should push in the same forward direction. And so here's the neat trick, is you can have an object in the water and remember that it has a front and a back surface, and you can use both of those in your innovation. And even in water jets, we see this trick employed. Yes, the foil surfaces on the impeller are still the main surface that generates thrust, but the water jet employs a few additional features just behind that impeller blade. We find the stators and the diffuser. A diffuser is a lot like an expanding cone that's used to slow down the water flow. And the angle of that cone converts that pressure into more forward thrust. This was a great innovation. It was possible to create a larger surface area if we trapped that area inside an internal pipe, because we've now hidden it from the external flow. It's just seeing our thrust generation. Now, of course, we don't get this trick completely free, but it still offers more benefit than hindrance. So it's a win in the end. And the final feature to talk about is thrust augmentation. If you go back to that table at the beginning, you'll notice that the thrust augmentation was a lot of the differentiating features between all of our different types of propulsors. These devices, they help to create the pressure difference by altering the flow conditions, but they don't create any power themselves. They just improve the efficiency of the other devices. Normally this effect is mild, only five to 15% difference. The trick is applying an effective device that's not generating extra drag through the water. One of the best examples for thrust augmentation is the propeller shroud. Hmm, a shroud hidden around a propeller, kind of like a pump jet. Now these shrouds, they might look like simple rings around the, the propeller, but this ring is formed from a wing's profile. And depending on the orientation of that wing, the shroud can either accelerate or decelerate the flow through the propeller. Small adjustments, but these small adjustments matter. Now for slow speed ships, we want to accelerate that flow to get slightly more thrust from the propeller. This would happen in pump jets and also on ducted propellers and tugs. Now, if we're talking pump jets more on submarines, those ducts are going to be more for acoustic reasons. And so it's hard to say whether they would accelerate or decelerate the flow. I don't think I would be able to find those details without a security clearance. Now let's reverse this idea. For high-speed ships, we want to do the opposite. The shroud decelerates the flow, which helps the propeller. The faster ships might be moving too fast for a normal propeller to be effective. So decelerating the flow, slowing it down slightly, that puts us back in the more efficient range for propeller operations. Going back to the idea of centrifugal forces, when we're talking higher speeds with the ship, we're also talking higher RPM on the propeller, so that duct is helping to contain the centrifugal forces and keep that flow moving straight through the propeller rather than flying off to the sides. And if we go to even higher speeds and start looking at water jets, the nozzle on your water jet, that acts as another form of thrust augmentation. The impeller on a water jet normally generates a relatively mild pressure difference at a high flow rate. Most of that water jet energy goes simply into moving the water through the pump, not a huge pressure difference. The nozzle on the water jet converts some of that kinetic energy and transfers it back into the pressure difference. So you notice there how the impeller is still the item injecting the force, but the nozzle is helping to change how that force shows up in the components that we actually want. So I know this video didn't provide a clear explanation for all propulsion. And I have to admit, the math behind propulsion is still very complicated. These are some pretty complicated devices. But I really wanted to reinforce the idea today that you're not doing yourself any favors by segmenting propulsion into different discrete devices. It's all the same physics. It's all a continuum of different solutions to the same problems. See, we suffer from the mistake of seeing these as separate methods and separate physics. A water jet still achieves the same goal as a propeller. And by seeing them as a continuum, where we ask the question of how are they achieving their essential tasks, we're starting to find new opportunities. We're seeing commonalities between these methods of propulsion. 
because this really isn't new. All propulsion is the same physics with just a different emphasis. And when you start looking at it like that, you get a roadmap to ask, what's the next combination that we're going to come up with? How are we going to take these old ideas and put them together in a new combination that looks like new propulsion, but is really just a new emphasis to the same old problem? Thanks very much. I am Nick, the Naval Architect. Thanks for watching. I hope you liked it. What is ship design to you? Because my job as a professional engineer is to take your understanding of ship design, that general goal, and turn it into technical specifications to make it a reality. So check out the website and let's see how I can take your dreams and make them possible. Thanks very much.